Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the S and W Pulse podcast. Uh, my name is Nick Travis. I'm a partner in Smith and Williamson, um, and I host the entrepreneurs uh, section of Pulse. You will have heard our previous episodes with David Spencer Percival. Last time we had Joel Hopwood. And if you listen to that episode, you will have heard Jamie Waller being discussed. And it's Jamie that we have with us today. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Nick. Um, As per our previous episodes, we are here to hear Jamie's story. So Jamie is a serial entrepreneur. He's a philanthropist, an author. um, And as I've just learned in the last 10 minutes, about to be yet another successful business grower. How many titles? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anything else I've missed there? Well, yeah, I think that's got to the more, yeah. Um, so, like I say, today's about your story. So, the audience will be interested to know how you came to be an entrepreneur. What were the good bits? What were the bad bits particularly interesting? Um, and what did you learn? Yeah, well, um, so, I mean, I've always been in business of some sort, I guess. So, as an early, early child, I grew up in Bethnal Green in East London. Um, almost, I think, sort of... The statistics are of about 80% of people that don't die growing up in Bethnal Green. 50% either go to prison or 50% end up self-employed. Oh, wow. So um, I was really fortunate that I ended up in the self-employed. And um, yeah, I started my career really, well, I started window cleaning. So I used to clean okay. people's windows and that led to me sort of realising that when you're a window cleaner, then what you do is you sort of have these loosely termed contracts with people ha- who resided in these houses and window cleaners used to clean one house and then get back in their car drive to the next street clean two houses then drive three streets away uh, and maybe have a contract to clean five others and yeah. i just thought this is crazy why don't you just dump the car at the first house and then between walking from street one to re- street two or street two to street five knock on every door saying do you want your your windows cleaned and if the, there was no answer i'd drop a little card through and they could give you a call so literally i mean it was crazy but within the space of a few months i went from myself cleaning windows to employing four other people cleaning cool. windows and then I thought, well, we should do some gardening services and various other things. So it just went on from there. And then when it got to the winter, I realised it's a really crap job in the winter, right? Yep. It's great in the summer. You're in a pair of shorts, walking around all day. So I decided to offload it. And, uh, you know, no corporate advisors needed when you're selling a business for £6,000. Yeah. But I put, it in the, <laughs> I put it in the back of a, a classified ad section, offloaded it, took that £6,000 and went and set up a car sales yard. So I wanted to do something different. I liked cars, uh, thought I could sell them easy. And I was really fortunate I found a disused piece of land. Yeah. So let me stay for a minute. So how old are you now? I'm so 17, 18. 17, yeah. Okay, so you're out of school, yeah. finished education. What are your friends doing at this time? 80% well, dead or in prison? Yeah, yeah, so those that were alive. So two had died by then, um, which is really unfortunate mm. but for various different reasons. Mm. And, um, yeah, I mean, the others were doing different things. Right? Some of them were in jail. Yeah. Um, one of them, actually out of our entire friendship group, um, sort of close friends that grew up in the same street as me one of them got out okay and sort of went off and uh, is now working as an insurance salesman or something and the rest of them are you know still and doing various other things that they probably shouldn't be doing or in and out of jail and stuff like that but yeah, i left school really young so i wasn't the brightest at school mm-hmm. um i've suffered with dyslexia pretty much well all my life but was only aware of it as i got older because you were just sort of branded as stupid then rather than dyslexic um and that made me struggle in school which meant that you know you either got bullied or you became the sort of the the joker and the 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 ring leader of the pack and i decided that route you know but i so i loved school but i loved it for all the wrong reasons i loved it for women i loved it for the playing the bunking off and everything else you could do (laughs) Um, which meant when it came to taking my first set of GCSEs, I walked into a GCSE classroom for for um, a history GCSE, and I literally wrote my name on the desk. I took a big marker in with me, you know, and the people did that then. It was called tagging the desk. I tagged the desk, and the teacher, who of course hated me because he had to put up with me for the last four years, <laughs> walked over and said, can I have a word outside? I went outside with him, and he said, you're being disqualified for cheating and I said what do you mean cheating he's like well you you wrote something down on a desk I was like it's my name I'll get that bit right I can assure you <laughs> you know I am not cheating he said nope and he disqualified me and I walked out of the school that day with him I was choked 
because I knew I had to go home and explain to my mum, and I was always very close with my mum, um, that I had just let her, let her down, you know? And I, I felt like crying, but I also felt really angry. Okay. So it sounds like your mum was a big influence then. Do you think that was a big factor in you not being one of the 90% that didn't become self-employed? Yeah, definitely. Because one thing that I had that, that throughout my entire childhood and all the way through to my adulthood, right up until today, my mum's now passed, is this massive amount of respect for my mum yep. and not wanting to let her down. So every time I did something wrong, I was absolutely aware of my mum in the background. Yep. So it meant that when I did do things wrong, I sort of did things 70% wrong rather than 100% wrong when my friends were going that extra mile yep. because I was always very aware of that. My mum and I were best friends and we had to be from a young age. My dad treated her really badly and it, it meant that mum and I bonded very, very severely at such a young age mm -hmm. and we sort of did everything together. We went through life together. Yep. But that definitely had a huge impact on me. So as much as I didn't want to ever let her down I also wanted to make her really proud and I knew that the way to do that was to you know it sounds silly but have a nice car mm. get a flat all of the, the things that some people take for granted but you know when you're growing up with not much opportunity yep. these are big things and, and they sort of a, a bit of self-worth okay so she must have been pretty proud a business sale in your teens is unusual yeah so you used that money, you went into used cars and take us on from the journey. So I was selling cars, that was going great. Uh, we had a great spot on the Woolwich High Road. So, you know, then car sales was all about location and the location had to be busy where it had loads of people driving past, not necessarily footfall, obviously, for obvious reasons, but also needed to be able to park to see something from, from sort of passing at 30 miles per hour to saying, okay, I'm going to pull over and walk back yep. 100 yards and see what, what that's all about. Um, and we had the perfect location from that. And literally from day one, we just made lots and lots of money. It was crazy. And I was 18 and probably making a couple of thousand pounds a week. And it was just, again, it was just an easy, an easy ride, really. And we weren't doing things great. But, you know, we, we had a nice showroom, nice location. And then unfortunate for me... You know, I'd like to convince myself that it happened overnight, but it probably didn't. But Red Route came into to London, okay. you know, so the, we got a mayor and they decided that they were going to paint single and double red lines across all the major routes of London, which meant that you could not stop at all. Where yeah. before, you know, you could stop for three minutes or do this, various rules. It came to not, to, to not being able to stop at all. And on, new, on the news channels every night, you know, I, I used to sit and sort of, flick on to London tonight and all you would see is all these traders from sort of Spitterfields going, well, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to tell my customers not to pay. Da, da, da. And then you'd get this smug looking chap from TFL going, well, if you don't pay, we're going to send the bailiffs. And I was just sat there one night thinking my business has gone now from making two to, to three grand a week to making literally about one car sale a month. Yeah. Um, and I just thought, what's this bailiff stuff all about? You know, that surely that market's about to take off if everyone's really not going to pay. So I started to look into to, to debt recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't as easy as when I say start to look into, you know, it wasn't grab your phone from the, from the arm of the sofa. You had to physically go and do something. So, you know, you had to go and look in a, a directory to look at uh, debt recovery and bailiff companies. You had to call them. You had to go and talk to people. And when I started to look, I realized that nearly all of them were recruiting for self-employed debt collectors. Right. And I thought, well, I can do that. I grew up in Bethnal Green, right? So I can, if someone's <laughs> going to try and give me a slap, I can handle that. Um, I'm a good salesman. Mm -hmm. I'll give it a go. Yep. And I, I went to, um, there was a, an advert for the job center on Hackney Road in East London. And I'm now living over in South East London. And I, I drove all the way over. And I still remember today because I... At the time, I was using my dad's car to, to get around because I just didn't have any money. Mm. And I'd had a massive bus stop with my dad that morning because I wanted to lend three pound for petrol. <laughs> and he said to me, this is about the fifth time you've lent three quid. And I'm like, dad, it's just three quid, you know, get over it. And he's like, but you never give it back. And we had this big bus stop. I'm like, I'm trying to get a job. I'm trying to sort myself out here. Help me out. And I took his car, went down to the job centre and... At the time then in a job centre, you had these like little cards up on a wall advertising each job and then you take it and get in a queue or take a paper ticket. And 
and stuff like that. And then I got to this desk after this palaver and sat down in front of this lady and she was like, I think you'll be great for it. And then what happened is they would call the company, do some sort of telephone interview on your behalf. I mean, right. it was just, it was ludicrous. Nobody was obviously trying to save money these days, uh, during those days. And, um, and the woman got off the phone, she looked really disappointed. She said, I'm so sorry, you have to be 21. And I said, this is a joke. It doesn't say anywhere. I've just come all the way over from Woolwich. To, it doesn't say anywhere you have to be 21. I was like, just let me talk to them. I'll convince them, you know, it'll be fine. And she was like, I can't do that. And I said, well, tell me what's the name of the company. Because it didn't, didn't advertise the name of the companies or anything on the board. It was all their secret information. And she said, I'm not allowed to tell you. And I just said, this is a craziness. I really want to do this. Da, 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 da. And she said, look, see that printer over by that blue screen? You remember those blue yeah, screens yeah, yeah. that used to sort of separate desks? She said, see that printer there? On your way out, pick up the first piece of paper. <laughs> And I didn't need to ask her what it was. I assumed what she was doing and she pressed print. I said, thank you. And I walked out and I picked up the piece of paper and I walked out and it was this sort of screen grab from an old dot matrix printer of an address and a company called Drake's Group. Right. And just by chance, I walked out. I was on Hackney Road at the job centre and I looked at it and it said number 520 odd Hackney Road. So I literally just started walking. And for any of the listeners that know Hackney Road, I walked and walked and walked. And about 30 minutes later, I arrived at this old bank, um, which was Drake's group. And I, I knocked on the door and they were so horrible to me because they're like, how dare you just turn up here? <laughs> and I'm like, you're a firm of betas, right? You do this all the time. You, should, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you really shouldn't be. <laughs> you really shouldn't be emotional about this. Um, and this guy, Harry, uh, poor Harry passed away recently. It ended up working for me. Uh, said to me come upstairs and Harry was the nicest chap in the world but God was he the most unfittest man in the world and we had to go up four flights of stairs and I remember we had to stop twice on the <laughs> way up for him to have a rest because he was so out of breath and on the way up I got to know him a bit and then we had this interview and he said to me tomorrow morning I'm going to send someone to pick you up at 4am mm -hmm. I want you to spend a day with him if he says that you're okay for it we'll give you a shot so then I just knew that all my job was to sell myself to this guy for the next day which I did and and we went on and I just realised really quickly that being a bailiff, the, in my view, I was an 18 year old kid, right? But I just knew that they just got it wrong. They thought given, being given this authority by government to go out and collect money on their behalf was being given the right to exploit. And I just saw it completely different. I was sat there on that day and I thought, wow, this is being given the right to sort of, you know, this was all, almost being given a concession rather than the right to exploit. Yeah. You should do this in partnership. You should do this by representing them well, and then you'll convince them to give you more debt, and you can grow out from that. And it was just silly things, like, you know, the bailiffs were in jeans and hoodies and baseball caps and yeah. all used to go around in twos. And, and, and so I, I worked at Drake's for a while, became their ops manager, and then just decided, you know what, I'm, I'm out of it. I'm going to do this myself. And how long was that period of time at Drake's then? Sorry, so I was at Drake's for about a year and a bit. It okay. wasn't very long. So we're now sort of, we're still only in, so 1998, I was 18, went to Drake's. Um, in the year 2000, I set up my first bailiff company. Right. And how, what was that like at first? Because I imagine a certain demographic of person that might spend their time knocking on people's doors aggressively aren't that happy to see you walk away presumably trying to nick some of their business yeah it was horrendous it could only be <laughs> described as horrendous so again you know by now i'm 20 or 21 i still haven't really realized what life's all about right mm. so i go into my boss's office one day i'm like bouncing around like bambi because i'm excited right i'm like oh i just want to let you know i'm actually going to go and set up my own company and, <laughs> yeah. da, 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 da. and then my sort of bambi legs become elephant legs because he just jumped up and started screaming and shouting and was like oh, no, i won't let you do this i will do this to you i would do that to you and i you know as much as i grew up in bethel green i was 21 and thought i was tough actually when faced with that amount of aggression and, and anger it was it was difficult, but I went off and I did it. Actually, what happened is he got two guys, um, and I knew these guys reasonably well, and he sort of went out of the office, screamed, get me X and Y. They came up, and he said, get him out of my office, take his car off him, da da da, da. And it was all over the top. And then for the next year and a half, I dealt with everything from threats of violence, from threats to petrol bomb my office, um, I was told that, that, that uh, a certain amount of money had been put up for the IRA to get rid of me. 
I returned home one evening, and it's difficult to, to absolutely say this was linked, but I got home one evening onto my driveway, and it was about eight, nine o'clock after a late night in the office, and I lived in some flats in Bowes, and not far away from Bethnal Green, and sort of, you know, shared parking up on, up on the pavement. And as I pulled up, both car doors each side come pulling open, and I got into this big scuffle while inside my car, mm. And as I was pushing my way out, these guys ran off and got in a van and sped off down the road. And I thought, you know, what the hell was all that about? And then all of a sudden I felt massive warmth all running down my arm and I'd been stabbed. Wow. Um, and they'd not robbed you or anything? Not robbed me attack. or anything. This was an attack. Yeah. This was, a, you know, somebody who wanted to get to me to, to, to scare me from doing things. And it was that night that I literally, because I was uh, mixed feelings from sort of, you know, wanting to get them back to also being frightened about, you know, at 22 and you're being threatened with the IRA and you know that you know that there is a possibility that at least one person that was involved in another business could have those connections. Yeah, sure. It was worrying, right? So I went in my house that night and I got open a toolbox and got some gaffer tape out, electrical tape actually, um, and taped up my shoulder, which was pouring a blood. And I sat there and I got, I didn't have great taste of whiskey those days. <laughs> I got a bottle of Jameson's out. Um, and I sat on the floor and I just cried. Mm. And I just broke down in tears. I lived on my own in this flat. Yep. And I just drank and drank and drank while sort of waiting for this shoulder to stop bleeding, wondering, should I go to the hospital? Or will they involve the police, et cetera, et cetera. And that scar's pretty nasty still today because it wasn't treated correctly, obviously. Um, but... You know, I went through a lot, but actually every time I went through a bit more, all it did to me was the only way I knew I could pay anybody back, and by this time I had a bunch of the industry against me, right, um, was to compete. And when you're fired up to compete like that, it's really difficult for anyone else to compete with you, right? Because, you know, I say it today, I'm involved in businesses today that go, you know, on Fridays we work from home. I'm like, why would you work from home on a Friday when everyone else is working from home? Fridays are worth three of every other person's day because your competitors are at home, right? Yeah. Stay in work on a Friday. So for me at 21, I was like, I'm going to work at 5 a.m. I'm leaving at 10 p.m. I'm getting an extra 10 hours a day. But those 10 hours a day are 10 hours when the others are getting pissed, doing drugs, sleeping, all the things they shouldn't be doing. Those 10 hours are probably worth 20 hours. Mm -hmm. And it was just that ambition and that fire in the belly to really prove to hurt them through their pockets because I had no other way of hurting them. Yeah. But you can't build a business on your own. And obviously you've built several. So how do you get other people, especially at the start of a journey where it's threatening to come aboard and get behind the vision? So I was, I was really, really fortunate in my life actually. And I always have been, I've always had people um, alongside me that have, have joined me for the journey for more than a job. Yeah. And not always all, and I'd be stupid to say that, you know, there's a bunch and probably the majority of the people in the business that are there because it's a, a job and they've got bills to pay, etc. But having those core bunch of people around you because they care and that they believe in the bigger picture, with that be, you know, it's unfair and it's unjust the way he's being treated, so I'm going to work extra hard. And one of the things I've found in life, and I still do it today, is actually if you if you take on some people that maybe you wouldn't have taken on, some underdogs, yep. the loyalty from that and the work ethic from that just pays dividends over and over and over again. So, you know, from those times in those early stages where I was sort of, you know, petrol bomb threats, I remember having young girls, and I mean like 19, 20, calling me from the office going, we've got three men downstairs on the CCTV kicking at the door, right. threatening to petrol bomb the office. <laughs> people shouldn't need to go through that, no. right? But these people did, and they did it because, not because I paid them well, because I didn't, um, not because I always treated them great, because I didn't, because I was also under my own stress and strains, um, but because they just saw that there was injustice and that what I was trying to do was the right thing. And we had a really good purpose, and that's one thing... I've probably learned more about purpose since exiting my first big asset, JBW, than ever before. But I've realized the importance of it. If you have a purpose and you can get others to agree with it or even own that purpose themselves, then that's amazing. And these people realized this is not right. 
And, you know, so I could sit in a room and say, if they're treating me like this, mm. how do you think they're treating the public yep. when they go to collect debts from them? Yeah. And if they believed in that, they wanted the business to grow and they wanted us to do right. And we did as a core. And we were a bunch of, we were a bunch of teenagers mm. setting up a bailiff business in Hackney yeah. to compete with some pretty horrendous individuals. But we were a bunch of teenagers with a purpose. We were a bunch of teenagers that knew that we believed wholeheartedly that people should not be terrorised. Just because you owe money does not be, mean you should be treated like a scumbag. And because we had that purpose, we just fought and we fought and we fought and we won. I mean, JBW went on to be the second largest company in the industry and the, the largest privately owned in the industry. So when I sold JBW back in 2016, we were just under 200 staff. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the figures are public, but we sold for around 40 million quid to a Japanese outsourcing firm. And, you know, it was still no external investment owned by us. And we, we worked really hard to achieve that. Tell us about the stage between sort of being a scrappy, ambitious business starter. And I guess when you've got 200 people, you need to have quite a high level of professionalism when you're going through a corporate transaction everybody starts to be around and everything needs to be dotted and uh, T's crossed in the right way. Yeah. Talk to us a bit about that transition of the business and then what was the deal itself like? So, yeah, I mean, so starting from the early days, I mean, it's really, it's really difficult, right? And I'm a strong believer in business that you need to oversell and then catch up with your delivery, oversell and catch up with your delivery. Not many people say that because they don't want to be honest yeah. that that's what business is about. But you can't be, you know, if we were a bunch of Oxford grads trying to get into the bailiff industry, we would have made it too complicated for ourselves to succeed. Yeah, okay. We had to keep things basic. So, and so in a way, our customers dragged us through that growth phase by demanding and expecting more. Okay. And that was great. And also us, as the core salespeople, it almost insisted our customers dragged it through because what we'd do is we'd overpromise and then we'd win and then we'd go, oh, we have to deliver, so we'd have to put in these processes. So we would bid for a piece of work and say, you know, oh, well, you know, we have a compliance department of six people and you have a compliance department of two. Well, guess what? You now need to build it out to deliver the contract because, you know, we'd, we were 100% B to G. We could have most of our government clients could turn up unannounced at any time. And by the way, if one of them turn up unannounced at any time and withdraw the contract from you, it doesn't take long for them all to know about that. Yep. So you could lose your business at any time, which meant you were always required to catch up very quickly. So there was an element of that. Um, but there were stages in the business, definitely, that I just thought, wow, I just want to give up. Because, you know, when you get to 5 million in revenue and you've got sort of 50, 60 people and you're just like, this is not really what I enjoy anymore. It's people issues after people issues. Mm -hmm. And then get to a stage and I've witnessed it with lots of friends in business and I've witnessed it myself where you just lose your confidence because yep. you're like well I was quite good at this when it was like go guerrilla marketing and exciting and da, da, da. but now it's like oh, I've got another meeting at the Ministry of Justice uh, to discuss new regulations that might be implemented in 12 years time you know you're <laughs> in a very different world um, so without a doubt employ the right people, put better people around you, all the standard things. You pick up any business book in any bookshop, or any lasting bookshop or, or Amazon to teach you that. But I think one thing that I did well, it took me a while to do it, but once I did it, I did it really well, was investing in myself. Okay. So I realised, I went along to a briefing for Cranfield Business School, their business growth programme in 2008. Um and then I thought, oh, I want to do it, but it's 15 grand. I, you know, it's a, it could be a waste of money. I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it. In 2010, I thought I'm either going to get rid of this business or I'm going to keep it and take it to the next level. And we were at 4.4 million in revenue, losing about half a million quid a year. Yep. And I went back to Cranfield and they'd said, oh yeah, no, the fee's now 17 and a half grand or something. I said, can I still have another 15 grand? Like, you know, I've been, took me long enough to make the decision to get to 15 grand. Don't try and get another two and a half grand out of me. So they said, yeah. And um, I went along to that and it completely changed my life because I came out of Cranfield with, a, with that new Bambi type activity of a spring in my step. Mm -hmm. And it, was, and it sounds stupid, but, you know, have, having the confidence to go into a room and talk about joint ventures, to talk about tax, to talk about various things that you don't really do when you're just getting going, just changed my whole life. And it made me fall in love with the business again. Mm -hmm. 
And what I've realized in business is that if you're not loving it, as the owner, as the entrepreneur, you might as well just give up because there's much easier things to do. Yep. You know, I talk to taxi drivers on my way here that are making 100 grand a year. I talk to entrepreneurs that have been in their business for 10 years and still aren't making that. Mm -hmm. So there are easier things to do. You've got to love it. And Cranfield made me fall in love with my business again. But more importantly, and I don't give Cranfield enough credit for this, Cranfield made me fall in love with education. And I came from an environment where I hated education because they had let me down. So that when I talked a little while ago about walking out of the building that day wanting to cry, that, what I didn't realise, left a big scar on me for many, many years. And in 2010, Cranfield removed that from me. And the reason they removed it from me is they treated us all equal. It didn't matter if you were an ex-Oxford grad or if you left school with no qualifications. You were in Cranfield. You deserve to be there because of what you've achieved through your business. And they were going to take you all on that same journey at the same time. And I came out of Cranfield on fire. Yep. And we took the business from, you know, from, from where it was and we just completely transformed it. So talk us through that then. So what do you do? Because there'll be lots of entrepreneurs listening. You go to Cranfield, presumably you refresh the strategy, you come out like Bambi and just overhaul the business? So the great thing about Cranfield, obviously, is that it, they drum it into you, actually. You should make the changes while you're here. Don't wait until after the course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just took that on straight away. So week one, I remember coming out with a task to sack a customer. They're like, you know, get rid of the customers that are a pain. They're just draining on you. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. So I had this one customer out in Essex. I just thought, he was horrendous. You know, he had... He had created two people in my business wanting to leave the business. They were in tears on two different occasions, contract managers. But I always chose him over them because he was a customer. But actually what Cranfield did is said, well, analyze it. Is he making you any money? Is he making you enough money for that pain? I said, no. And I went back and sacked him. And then after then, actually what Cranfield did quite, um, quite well is you went back every two weeks. Those who made the biggest impact on their business in that two weeks won a bottle of champagne there could only ever be two winners okay. well i made it my determination to get a bottle of champagne every two weeks right well because <laughs> one i wanted to be the winner but two it's quite nice to go to the bar and share a bottle of champagne with everyone you help helps make friends on the course quickly um so i made loads of changes but the biggest change i made was around technology mm. so we worked in an unsexy business yep. uh, a very primitive business and i realized that we were having to compete every time on these real soft skills, like we will be better, we will get you a better return. Well, guess what? Everyone says that, right? When they're trying to sell. And uh, I sat in rooms over and over again saying, we need a tech play. We need something that's so different that nobody can touch us. How are we gonna do that? And at the time I was an avid user of Addison Lee, the car hire firm. And I used to sit in meetings and go, we need, look at what Addison Lee's achieving. No, and all that Addison Lee was doing, it doesn't sound impressive now, but you could get a car anywhere within inside the M25 in 15 minutes. Yeah. And the way their allocation technology worked, which is still impressive, it enabled it to interrupt journeys. So it could allocate you a driver and then disrupt that allocation by giving you another driver as and when it was monitoring how people moved around the inner part of, of London. And that, it sounds simple, to, but to build in tech is really quite complex. And then one day in a board meeting, I said, look, has anyone ever just picked up the phone and said to Addison Lee, who did you use to build this? And can we maybe get an introduction? And they went, no. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. And I was in a bad mood. I was like, I'm going over to Pizza Express, with a Pizza Express officer, our office, for my lunch. I want somebody to talk to them. We'll reconvene in an hour's time. And I went over to Pizza Express, and within about 15 minutes, my head of IT come sort of running over and said, Weirdly, they want to launch their IT company and have been looking for a customer. They asked if we want to go there now. Yep. They'll send some cars for us. So I said, absolutely. So they sent some cars for us. We went there and we did a tour of Addison Lee. And actually, I have to say, the company was structured just beautifully. You went in and the owner at the time had this thing about he wanted to bring people into his environment to sell to them. Okay. And the business was built like that. So when you walked in, there were screens everywhere. There was a screen for this, a screen for that. Most of them probably absolutely unnecessary, but it looked great. <laughs> and there were, you know, it was beautiful. And it looked like you were walking in, you know, you could control spaceships from this place, not little black Volkswagen cars. Yeah. Um, and we spoke to them and they said, we would love to do a deal. And I went and met John, the owner, sat in front of John and said, John, I've got, I haven't got money to be paying you millions of pounds, but listen, we need to do something together here. We'll give you the ability to get it all wrong over and over again. Yeah. And we'll give you a glowing reference that said, you never got it wrong. 
and you can go <laughs> on and sell loads of IT for the rest of your life and I get what I need and we did a deal and you know and they did get it wrong but ultimately um, through time and through a good partnership approach we built the most advanced technologies to ever exist in that sector and to give you an example of some of the things that took the biggest problem in the enforcement sector is the amount of qualified or good resource you can call it, you can employ bailiffs if you don't mind employing loads of ex-doormen that work Friday and Saturday night at a club and that want to do Monday to Wednesday collecting debts well we didn't want those people we had a we had a strategy that we wanted salesmen we wanted to convince double glazing salesmen that this was a good opportunity we wanted to to convince people that the job was about convincing someone to pass with money for something they don't want, yeah. which is exactly what a salesman is trained to do, <laughs> right? No one needs a new car, but you've got to convince them that they want to buy a new car. And this is what we wanted. So, which meant we were always resource restrained. And in our company, the average time we used to visit a debtor to get them to pay was up at 5.9 times. Okay. And through the implementation of technology, and it took a while, we got it down to 1.7. Well, we were untouchable then because when you can bid for a contract alongside your competitor, but you're, you only require a third, less than a third of the amount of resource to provide the yeah. service, well, guess what? We were just able to grow like wildfire and we just took on all of the big contracts after that because we not only offered transparency, we offered a consistent approach across the whole country because we controlled the behaviour. So we were the first person, before Uber, we were doing one allocation at a time to agents. Um, so we had built all this stuff into our tech that meant that the customer felt safe, but ultimately they were getting a much better quality of service without you know if you visit someone five times versus once well guess what you've increased the chance of a complaint by 500 percent. yeah of course all right so it was silly stuff like that it was really successful but i must say cranfield was only the start so i left cranfield two years later i thought okay what's next i went off to stanford and i did their um executive education program which was a sort of another step up so for for um cranfield you have to have a business of two million pound revenue for stanford you have to have a business of 10 million dollars okay. in revenue and then i went from stanford to berkeley and did a course there um, so i continue to i found my love for education and still today as, as you said i've exited a few businesses now every year during the christmas break during that sort of resolution break yeah. i decide what i want to learn more about next year okay. and i book myself a course on that so this year it's in digital marketing at inside in in france yeah. and last year i did a venture capital course in Berkeley, and it's something that I hope I take through with me for the rest of my life. I want to be the 85 year old sat in the lecture <laughs> room with the 25 and 30 year olds because I've realized that actually, you know, forever learning is not a bad thing. Yeah, it's an amazing turnaround from somebody. That, it shows the education system's not well set up for people that have Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrendous, yeah. right? I mean, it was terrible because actually, if I think of my first two years in secondary school, I was a bright kid. So my first two years in secondary school in St. Bernard's in Bethnal Green. I was bright, and if anything, I was bullied for being a boffin. And then what happened one day, someone had bullied me to such a degree that I attacked him, and I attacked him badly with a chair, and I was, I was expelled from school. I had two yeah. years of a beautiful <laughs> record. This guy was a complete toe rag, um, and I got expelled. And that was a, you know, it dwindled from that stage onwards. Yeah. And just, I mean, I'm not too sure if it's got any better. Um, since then, I don't know, but it was horrendous at the time, and it must have let down so many people. I think you've heard Rod Aldridge speak about this. Yeah. I might actually try and get him on the show and get... That'll be the segue to the next the next speaker. Yeah. Um, so let, let's round off the JBW story, because that's, you know, as you've said, the first big one. Yes. Um, so you've come out of Cranfield, you've gone to um, you know, two big standout uh, US universities to, to further that journey. Were you always thinking about the sale? And if you were at least having it in the back of your mind, were you structuring the business for sale? Did you concentrate on certain KPIs to make sure you got the right price, talk us through the process. Yeah. So the business, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, from day two, it was always for sale. Yeah. Um, and that boundary just kept on moving, you know. So I remember when I first set up, my target was, I want to make a million pounds. Then it was four, then it was seven, then it was 20. Right. And I actually sold when my target, my my head target was I need to, I want to make 24 million quid. God knows where these started come from. You just keep pushing them out and pushing them out. Um, but so the business was always for sale, but it wasn't always dressed for sale. Mm. But what I did do is again post, and I would say probably more Stanford than Cranfield on this one, which was, you know, 
Sanford drilled it into you that your your business you will make the most money for your business when someone approaches you to sell it rather yeah. than you put it on the market. But if they approach you to buy it and you're not ready, it will fall through. And if anything, you'll damage your brand to such a degree that it will now be worth less than if you had put it up for sale. And it was a horrible thing to think of like that. So when I came out of Stanford, I thought we need to start having you know daily KPI reports, weekly, monthly, different KPI monitoring reports, but we need to track this stuff. We need to also show evidence that when something has changed, there was a decision behind change and it didn't just happen because you know the weather changed or if the weather does change. So we learned a million things about JBW after Stanford by tracking this stuff. So we realized, for example, that weather patterns affected our collection activity. I would have never known that unless I went to Stanford. So we could predict the, if we were gonna, if the, if we were gonna have snow next month, well, we can change our forecasting accordingly because we've got enough data from the previous years to know. But we had never monitored that stuff. We were still beating everyone up, going, "Why are collections down?" Da, da, da. And obviously, the people employed weren't s- s- supposed to know this either. They're like, "I don't know why collections are down," and everyone's got a guess. So we were monitoring all that stuff. But what we did do, absolutely. So when we made the decision that we are going to sell this business. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, we are going to sell this business, let's sell it now. It was, we're going to sell this business. When is the right time to sell this business? So I engaged with a bunch of corporate finance companies and had that discussion with them. Early. Really early. Actually, so to give you an idea, I'm going to jump away from JBW just for two seconds. I've got a few businesses that I'm involved in now. Two of them are startups. I've already had that conversation with corporate finance houses. Because if I'm starting it now, which means I've got the ability to structure it, why don't I structure it right to begin with rather than try and change changing a structure in an environment is awful. But back to JBW. So I went and I had these conversations, you know, coffee, this, the corporate finance advisors are always welcome to have coffees and a chat. I mean, they're, they need to be having these, right? They need to be having a thousand of these a year to make sure they get 200 jobs a year. And I spoke to them about, well, we want to dress for sale. How are we going to dress for sale? And they suggested some different improvements most of them, it suggests the same stuff, but there are always others that go that extra mile. And we found that with our advisors. Our advisors were willing to engage early. They were willing to do a bit of work now for free on the basis that, and it wasn't even, you know, you will instruct us later. It was that you'll just at least consider us later and stuff like that. Um, and that really helped us because if anything, the advisors were then like, well, we'll think you'll be ready in 12 months. And we're like, well, no, we'll take 18 because we, we believe we wanted to leave enough on the table yep. for the buyer because we were all about, you know, if you rinse a company for its maximum value, its maximum sort of, you know, I, it must be at 1.5 million pound EBITDA versus the 1.2 I'm at now because... I get a multiple of eight on the extra 300 grand. Well, actually, I, I just think that's all rubbish. Mm-hmm. I think you're much better off trying to get the multiple up from eight to nine. Yeah. So sell something they want to buy rather than trying to rinse the maximum value out of something that's got no growth potential or they're going to have to work so hard to get their own growth. And I think, actually, I, I don't think, I know our corporate finance advisors were at an event recently and I was in the audience and I heard them speak and they were talking about us as a case study yeah. about, you know, we had not only planned correctly, which means the company was really clean and able to sell, but we had left significant upside on the business. And I mean, to give you an example, that business has just completed another acquisition last, last week. I employed the CEO as I was leaving. Um, so I've got a great, very clean relationship with them. And that business is now tripled in size since 2016. Wow. Different strategy, buy and build. Mm-hmm. But that's what happens when you sell a good business. And one of my things was, was if I'm going to sell a, a business at 38 when I've still got all of this time left in this industry that we call entrepreneurship, yep. I need to sell a good business. I don't want to be every night I sit around tables when people sit there pumping their chest like this, going, oh, look, I mean, since I sold it, it went down the pan, da, da, da. and they've got some sort of pride from it. That's no pride for me. That's a rubbish CEO. That's a rubbish entrepreneur. Or that's an entrepreneur that never, ever converted to be a good CEO. Because a good CEO would sell a business that's grounded and can survive without them. And that's what I did at both my past businesses, which means that if I was to rock up, and I don't very often, but if I was to rock up for investment, a PE house or a VC, Mm -hmm. I can go, oh, yes, and I, I was the the majority shareholder and founder of JBW, I was the majority shareholder and founder of Hito. And they can look at those companies and they can reference them and they can go, wow, 
sold it there and it went there, sold it there and went there. Yeah. We like some of that. So I've been very proud of that. Yeah. So JBW, big substantial sale. What, as a young man from Bethnal Green, does it feel like when a large number hits your bank account? Are you relieved, scared? Is it? It's quite totally weird, exciting. actually. No. Yeah. What? I always say, I mean, that I think the journey is much better than the arrival. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's the best way to put it. Um, I mean, as most of the listeners will know, these things never happen quite simply. So these deals are always meant to happen at 6 p.m. of a night. They all yeah. happen at 6 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. So everyone's been awake all night. Emotions are high because there's always some last minute things that could make the deal collapse and you're tired, but yeah, excited. But I, I mean, I went home. I was just around the corner from your offices here in Moorgate when the deal happened. Um, and I went home to South West London and got my head down for a couple of hours. But I set my alarm because I wanted to be awake at nine to call my key customers to tell them because I didn't want them to find out via the press release that was going out in Tokyo a few hours later in the day. Okay. So, you know, I literally got my head down for a few hours, woke up, called a few key clients and until about 10.30 a.m. and then took the rest of the day off. But I took the rest of the day off, but, you know, I'd, I'd arranged to take a couple of weeks off because then I was back in as chair, right? Mm -hmm. But my job as chair was full-time until I'd embedded the new CEO. So, but that two weeks, I just, you know, I spent doing stuff. But, it was, I mean, the funny thing about that day is my wife was saying to me, what are we going to do, you know? What should we do? And I was like, I'm not too sure. You know, let's, this doesn't need a big fuss. And she was like, oh, oh, but I've been looking at these hotels. We can go to the Belgari Hotel. They've got a beautiful suite and spa there. We could go for a couple of nights, et cetera, et cetera. And we'd just had our first daughter uh, not too long before. So I think it was more for my wife wanting a break at the yeah. uh, hotel of a spa. And what we ended up doing is I said, you know what? There's one thing I want to do. And she got really excited. She said, what is it? What is it? And I said, I want to go to Bethnal Green for some pie mash. Nice. <laughs> and now anyone from East London will know that that's a real moment, you know. So we went to Bethnal Green with my youngest daughter who had had an accident on the way and we hadn't bought any spare clothes for. So we had wrapped her up in this, like, whatever you call it, a shawl, a blanket, um, took her into Bethnal Green Road pie mash shop. She sat there <laughs> naked, wrapped up in a towel. My wife and I, my wife's dressed and looking all stunning like she's ready to go to a spa. I'm sat there absolutely reeking because I've been up all night, um, drinking beer at the lawyers, waiting to try and sign the deal. <laughs> and um, yeah, we had some pie mash and we went home and it was as eventful as that. I, uh, what I do remember, because I asked for the receipt, is that our celebratory lunch cost us £4.30, <laughs> uh, which is probably the cheapest lunch. Even prep on the way here cost me more than £4.30. <laughs> and my daughter had mash and liquor, and my wife and I had pie and mash, and yeah, that was it. I mean, but it was all we wanted, right? Because actually, I never did it for the money. I wanted the money because I grew up with nothing. I grew up in a two-bedroom shop, a uh, two-bedroom flat above a shop in Bethnal Green. But I, it was more about the achievement. It was about proving yeah. myself worth. And what I realized soon after is, you know, the money in the bank, unless, which I'm not, you know, you're, you're going to go off and travel around the world on a private jet. I mean, even that's going to get boring at some stage, I would assume. I haven't done it yet. Um, you know, I wasn't that way. So it's nice to have money, but it just brings a whole host of other problems, right? So now I'm thinking of, well, how do I make sure it doesn't, we don't dwindle it? How do I save some for the children? How do you give it to the children without completely ruining their own lives and et cetera, et cetera. So it was a it was a nice moment, but I was, but I also was aware that I divested the IT, and we'll probably tell the story there. So I divested yeah. the IT system out when I yeah. sold JBW, and so another um, quite canny move. Yeah, this was a canny <laughs> move. So I decided uh, again, you know, giving yourself that time to sell the business, you can make sensible decisions, right? So I knew if I went around and spoke to everyone who sold a business, they'd say, the thing is, Jamie, right before the end, they'll try and chip you on price, they'll try and chip you on price, they'll try and chip you on price. Mm. So how do you deal with that? Do you go, okay, well, I'm going to be ready, you know, I'm going to put some boxing gloves on, I know they're going to try and chip me on price. Well, you can, or you can be a bit smarter about it. And I thought I'm going to be a bit smarter about it. So what I did is I divested the IT system out into another company and I licensed the IT back. So during negotiations, I always held on to the IT part of the business. It was paying the IT company a license fee of about, I don't know, say half a million quid a year. It's really not important. Um, and they're like, but we want the IT company, Jamie. I'm like, well, it's not for sale. You know, you've got what you want. 
I'll always license you to technology. Because I, all I wanted it for is when they try and chip me on price, I go, okay, we can have the IT company, but pay me what you said you'll pay me. Yeah. That was the strategy. But as we got stronger and stronger, they started saying, well, can we buy the IT company as well? And I was like, nope, nope. And then we got to literally a couple of weeks before the deal, and they said, can we at least be an investor in the IT company? And I said, yeah. Um, so they gave me an extra two million quid to own half, just under half, I think, or maybe just a, maybe 51%. I think they had a majority, but minority controls. Um, so they bought 51% because they needed it because they were a listed company. Uh, they gave me two million quid for that. And a million I took out myself and a million I told them I'd pump into the business to get it going. Mm -hmm. So I then acted as chair, transitioned um, JBW into its new CEO, who's doing a wonderful job today. And I owned Hito, which yeah. was this sort of, at the time, just this product in this company with a million quid. Okay, well, what do we do with it? So we, we decided to build it out. And we decided to take the product from what it was, which was you know an in-house product, which isn't easy, actually, to make it then a product that you could pick up off the shelf. Um, well, not pick up off the shelf, but, you know, pipe into it in the cloud and, and sell it to, to others. And we built out that business. We were really successful. We put a good team around us. We built an amazing brand. You know, the value of brand in today's world is yeah. so important. Um, and we went to market. But what what didn't happen during the confusion of the deal, et cetera, is the investors never took an exclusivity period longer than the 12 months that they had had in JBW. So actually leading towards the end of that exclusivity period, and we were getting more commercially hungry, we realized the easiest market for us to sell this product to was companies like JBW. Yep. Right. Rather than trying to sell it to companies that go, okay, yeah, I can see how it works over there. And if you tweaked it like this, it could work for us. Why don't we sell it to a company where you walk in and go, you see how it works over there and the wonders it's doing? It can do it for you. So I approached the investors and said, look, you know, one or two things needs to happen here. You need to buy a longer exclusivity off the business, which we would have accepted because it would have given us more money and a runway to sell what we, our big prize was selling into banks yep. and government. Or I've got, a few of your competitors, but mainly one who was the largest, who are, you know, really want to buy this system. Mm. Now, your version will always be exclusive to you. They will have a different version, but that's what we're going to have to do. And they said, but hang on, Jamie, we own half this business. You can't sell it to competitors of our other company. And I'm like, but you're an outsourcing company. If you've got that attitude, I couldn't sell it to anyone. Yep. You're one of the biggest outsourcing companies in the world. You have a competitor everywhere, right? You have a competitor accountancy. You have a competitor because they own everything. So it's like your argument is useless <laughs> in that world. So we started to have these conversations and they were like, well, what's it going to cost? And I was I don't know, probably five million quid for a lifetime or something. You know, you're already paying 500 grand a year in revenue. And then one day they said to me, how about we buy the business from you? And it was really weird, actually, because my wife was pregnant with our second child and due to give birth any day. And those moments in your life are really pivotal because they get you thinking. And for this whole year of owning Hito, I had spent between London, Russia, where the development house was, and Tokyo. And so I was roughly the first year of my daughter's life, Emily, I'd spent sort of a couple of weeks in London and the rest of the weeks on flights and on FaceTime yeah. to her. Um, my second daughter's about to be born and I thought, well, let's see what they say. So I said to them, and these were my instructions, they were very clear over the phone. I said, you make an offer, it's one offer. If it's too low, I will just say no, but you will never put another offer in again. I will not ask you for another offer because I haven't got time for this. My wife's due to have a baby, this is a massive distraction for me. Um, or you don't make an offer at all. You make a decision, you do it by Friday. This was on a Tuesday and we were away in Europe. Um, we have a boat, so we did spend some money. And I woke up in the morning and I remember opening my email on my phone. And so, you know, you see the email and you're like, oh no, they're gonna say no. <laughs> uh, you know, if you hold out an ultimatum, yeah, you've got to yeah, be yeah. willing to accept it. But I opened the email and they offered me 10 million quid and said, you know, uh, and I'd been building it for nine months and I went, okay, deal done, as long as you can complete in two weeks' time because that's when <laughs> Allegra was due to be born yep. and I didn't want to be, because no matter how clean these deals are, you're always stuck with lawyers and uh, so I said, as long as you complete in two weeks' time, they actually just came back saying, we'll complete in seven days and they, they completed in nine days or something. Nobody ever completed, they're supposed to complete. But um, 
And they don't usually complete within 10 days. No, <laughs> they never <laughs> complete <laughs> within 10 days. No, so that was, um, that was pretty amazing. But uh, one thing I should point out is another good message for getting good advisors at this stage is before I did that, you put one offer in and one offer in only, is I called my corporate finance advisor and I said, I know this is not what you do, yep. but I think that this ultimatum will be better coming from you than me because of the emotion attached to it. Yeah, yeah. Do you fancy getting involved in helping me out of this? And what would you charge? And they came back, um, and I've publicly spoke about the figure, so I will. They said, look, we'll do it, Jamie. We want 25 grand if it goes through. Mm. If it doesn't, I think they wanted five grand or something for the messing around. And I said, thank you, done. Um, so they did that ultimatum and they also did the sort of to and throw in to get it over the line during that 10 days, which, you know, I was really happy to give them the 25 grand. It's totally not what they do, yep. which for me is the biggest reference point for people when they're going to go out of their way to, to help through that sticky situation. Yep. So we did the deal and we did it actually the day of Allegra's birth. So again, <laughs> so both deals were sort of within, you know, months of, of children. Um, but it was a great it was a great deal. But what I wasn't prepared for is actually becoming unemployed all of a sudden. And yep. that was a horrendous feeling. That was really tricky and one that I wouldn't like to repeat. So I guess at that like a lot of people at that point, you diversify is is one word for it. <laughs> so you start to do different things. One of the things I wanted to talk about um, was your view on angel investing, what you see as a good business, which I think will lead into some of the way you think the ways you think about business and yeah, how they should be valued and and you know why unsexy businesses might be yeah better than big tech businesses. So yeah, so I mean, obviously during the ten days, not a long time through to completion, you start thinking about well, what next, yeah. right? And there's always that where I'm going to take X time off and da da da, and you're sort of negotiating with your wife if that should be a hundred years or a year. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we ended up Which, getting what did she want by the way? Uh, yeah, she wanted a hundred <laughs> years, and I got I think I got her down to a month off would okay. be you know a good good time, and so we took a, yeah we took a maybe a bit longer than a month, six to eight weeks off. I think it was six weeks actually before we launched um, Firestarters, which was our investment brand. Yep. And we decided that we'd set up an investment fund. It sounds massive. It was sort of 15 million quid into a fund to invest in early stage businesses. Mm -hmm. So not startups, but people that have got some traction yep. that are trying to, um, through expertise and some money, can do, can do a lot better. And um, we launched that business, as I say, about six weeks after the exit. And... You know, wasn't quite prepared for the influx of you know <laughs> yeah. emails and communication, and you know I said, like, "Wow, this is crazy." I thought I was going to run this via a mobile phone. Yeah. Um, that was pretty pretty intense. But one of the things I was certain of, even in that six weeks, having built a few businesses, a couple of businesses previously, is you know you've got to make some boundaries, make some rules, and stick by them. Mm -hmm. So a few of the things for me was you know the businesses must be turning over over a million less than five. Yeah. Okay. Um, the businesses must not be in where everyone else is playing, which was that tech, which I brand sort of sexy businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and that they had to be majority owned by founders, but not family businesses, okay. uh, because I didn't want the complexity that come with unwinding relationships and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and no other external investment. Right. So there was quite a lot of boundaries there, but it meant that rather than getting 100 calls a day, I was getting 10, um, and even 10 is too much. And one of the things you realise going into this sector really quickly is deal flow is a pain because there is so many people out there looking yeah. for money. Um, but that did mean that I was able to get hold of some good assets or the right assets. I mean, you never know they're good, right? Mm -hmm. Um and some aren't so good and some, some go so bad. But one thing I would say, I've got 14 companies in my portfolio now. Two have crashed and burned. And those two that have crashed and burned, I, actually another has um, recently failed, I should say, actually. So three in total. But two went horribly wrong. But those two that went horribly wrong were because I completely went outside of my own boundaries. Mm. Because I knew the people involved. I backed the person rather than the entire sort of tick boxes do yeah, does sure. it tick these six boxes so you know i lost a million quid last year on those two deals which is pretty painful it's nice to have enough money to lose a million pound and not be hanging yourself or you know try, not sleeping and yeah, yeah. but it's still it's it's not a nice thing True. when you're only used to succeeding and then you have a couple of failures it's it, it takes a takes a knock so i would say sticking 
create an environment for yourself that you believe you understand or at least if you don't understand it you believe in going back to that having a purpose mm -hmm. um you know are these the sort of people you want to help be successful themselves that was a key one for me um and then stick into it but you'll always be tempted to go off peace always yeah and that's difficult i can totally see that so so the types of companies that you uh, tick your boxes then are these unsexy businesses unsexy businesses and I yeah. think when you know we've known each other for a while now the compulsion for people to go towards the sexy businesses and not necessarily put a lot of weight behind a business that's turning over a modest amount of millions but is doing window cleaning or yeah. debt recovery um, led you to take it under your own uh, steam to write a book I about did. those unsexy businesses yeah so talk us through that how did that so germinate and, and take, take seed. I was passionate about this, right? So I've been uh, a member of an entrepreneur's club here in London for many years. Uh, I go to various entrepreneur events, a lot of them hosted by yourselves here at S&W. And one of the things that really stood out over my years of, of being the CEO and the founder of JBW is you'd sit at a round table event with 20 people and you go, okay, let's all do introductions from left to right. And everyone goes around and says, hi, I'm Tom. And I own a digital design agency and da, da 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 and everyone's like, oh, Tom, yeah, well, we should catch up later, you know. I've got some <laughs> digital design ideas and then I'm Tim and I've got an app that, you know, connects dog walkers with dogs and they go, oh, yeah, I've got a dog. Da, da, da. And then you get around to Jamie and be like, oh, Jamie, I own a bailiff company. And they'll be like, okay, Jamie, and next one is... And I thought, this is driving me mad, right? Because I, I employ 175 people. I'm, I'm paying 175 families mortgages i'm i'm serving a real purpose here i'm making sure that we've got enough public funds because we were a b2g business collecting on behalf of government mm. we were making sure that government wasn't going broke so that they could pay for nurses and clean your streets and empty <laughs> your bins and you don't care and i was like i was really <laughs> hurt lose it and say that. <laughs> take the table over but i was i was really pissed off i was like this is crazy because there are good people you know and i remember the one day that it really clicked for me there was another guy in the room um, who was a member of the same entrepreneurs club who owned a cleaning company, a commercial cleaning company. And again, his business was beautiful. It was like four million pounds in revenue, about a million pounds in profit. You're talking 25% profit margins in commercial cleaning. I'll have some of that, please. Um, but nobody was interested. And it was then that I just thought, the world is going mad. Yep. The world is going mad. Nobody cares. All that anybody cares about is how much you were valued at at your most recent fundraise. And it's irrelevant. I mean, I picked up the paper this Sunday and saw, I won't name the company for a number of reasons, but also the date that this might go out. But, you know, a company that I know the owner of very well and was going like wildfire over the years in the US, in the UK, and uh, in, some, in South America, it's been growing. And everywhere he is, he's the hero in the room because he's raised another bit of money at 40 million, 50 million. He was in the paper this weekend. They've sacked him. They're suing him. They're going after him for $4.8 million. And he's only got a million dollars, you know. Yeah. That is the reality of some of yeah. these sexy businesses. I'm not saying that sexy business isn't good. I'm just saying it's risky and it's tough and everybody's playing there and the valuations are crazy and the chances of getting it right are, are slimmer than choosing a business model that we know works. And what I find with the majority of sexy businesses are is that they're trying to bring a new business to market. So you're not only betting on the entrepreneur, but you're also betting on the idea and are the are the buyers going to accept it do they want it do they need it oh i've done some market research oh great yep. so a thousand people are asked a question and happen to tell you what you wanted to know it's just not good enough for me <laughs> my market research is can i see people doing it every day so i'm looking out the window here now i can see people walking down the street drinking coffee yeah so i know that that market exists i don't need to do any market research right i can see again looking out the window now there's two different women with buggies I know that buggies are required. <laughs> yeah. I don't need any market research. Market research companies, pff, go away. I don't need it. I'm doing my own market research. So I like these businesses. I like businesses that I know there's a market for because it, as far as I'm concerned, reduces the chance of failure immensely. But also you can bring some small innovations in to make big changes, right? So for example, my first innovation in the bailiff industry was to put our, our officers in uniform. Well, that enabled us to sell our first five contracts because we were offering something different. Mm. Our second innovation was to take them from going round in twos to put them in ones. That enabled us to sell another three contracts. And you can make really small incremental innovations to these sectors and make a huge difference. Yeah. So I coined the term unsexy business and decided that I 
not only wanted to continue my focus to be in it for the rest of my life, but I also wanted to promote those that I believe have been left behind from yep. those conversations. So I went and wrote a book called Unsexy Business. Um, it did very well. It did very well. Yep. So yeah, it's still selling masses and actually got lots of tra attraction in the States now, which is great. Uh, the States is full of unsexy businesses, if you think about it, sort of the land of hope. Um, and number one business book of, London, of yeah, time, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, so uh, Amazon bestseller for business yep. uh, in 2019, yep. which is fantastic. And, we're, you know, we're still selling thousands of copies, signed deals in South Korea, France, and are trying to negotiate a deal in China at the moment. So the book is really successful. And, I didn't and there's a link to, below this podcast for you to buy your copy. Thank you. I should have said that, right? I'm not good enough to promote that. But, um, you know, it sells really well. And, you know, one click on Amazon for a tenner and it's in, in your hands or you can probably scrape along to some of these bookshops and hopefully find a copy in one of the everlasting bookshops that exist. And I think it is, you know, it's one really enjoyable. It's really accessible and honest. Yep. Um, and if you need an entrepreneur's uh, applaud it, Joel has apparently gone through 25 copies. <laughs> uh, Joel Hopwood from the previous yep. podcast, he hands it out as a, a guide. So, I, and that's, I guess, one of the things I'm loving about the book, actually, is I, that, so Joel's one of about 10 people that have said to me that they buy it in bulk. Yep. They've bought it in bulk to give to their staff. People are giving it to their clients. And that's really lovely because that means, you know, it really is spreading out wide. And that's a great feeling. And I just, yeah, it, it was a real pain to write. Yep. It wasn't, you know, the process is not great, but it's, um, but it's out there, it's selling well. I don't care if it sells well, right? What I care that how many copies it sells is not about spread revenue generating, story, yeah. it's the spread of the story. But the stories are great. So yes, as you said, you know, you've got Charlie from Pimlico, you've got Mike from from um, from Dreams, you've got Reginald Larry Cole from yep. Wheels for Sure that's advertising LBC almost daily at the moment. Um, so you've got loads of different stories and what we managed to do is we got a diverse bunch of individuals from diverse backgrounds, from diverse upbringings, people that grew up in public education boarding school right through to people that grew up as orphans mm -hmm. um, in, in other countries and, and came here as immigrants and we told their stories we told them real and we also dragged out of them if you were to give people some quick fire tips on how to make less mistakes what would they be and we yeah. document those in the back of each chapter so you can get access to those even if you don't want to read the book yeah. you can read 10 pages or 12 pages of the book and get 12 people's tips mm -hmm. on what you can do mm -hmm. and then more more recently in the last six months we also um, put it on audible which is doing very well too great and back to that point of um encouraging people and you know i suppose back to the, you know the reflection on your childhood as well what are the other things that you spend you know time is valuable one of the other things that you spend your valuable time doing is trying to help younger typically more disadvantaged children um come through various different yep. um streams one with the prince's trust and the other with imps yeah which i remember texting jamie i was at the lambeth county fair and he previously told me that there's a children's motorcycle Display team. <laughs> Display team. I said, that's not a real thing. <laughs> and then I saw them and they were brilliant. Um, so talk us a bit for about what made you choose those two things and yeah, well, how can anyone listening help? Absolutely. Well, thank you for the opportunity. So the IMPS, um, so I was really fortunate. The IMPS was once known as the Hackney Adventure Project. Hackney Adventure Project was set up to take children out of East London and give them an opportunity. And that opportunity was to take them away to the countryside so they could do activities and stuff over weekends away from their homes. And traditionally, they were taking kids out of sort of broken marriages and stuff like that. And my mum was in an abusive marriage, but never confident enough to get rid of my dad. Um, but was confident enough to see this. So we went to London Fields in Hackney. She saw this take place. She heard them announce over the speakers of yeah. what it was about. And she walked me up and said, my son wants to join. So I was in the IMPS motorcycle display team from the age of five until wow. 16, every single weekend from Friday night until Sunday and every school holiday. So I was away for just over 20 weeks a year, which kept me out of the streets of East London, which are also a lot to thank for, for, yeah. for uh, got into where I got to today. Um, but has helped uh, over 2,000 children, all set up by one chap, Roy Pratt. And Roy was 30 when he set it up. Yeah. He's still running it today. Roy is just yeah. over 80 and still runs a team and it still does the amazing work. But unfortunately for the Imps, about six years ago, it got into real financial difficulty. They lost, they were sponsored by Honda motorcycles for many years. You can imagine 40 odd kids, that's 40 odd motorcycles that need replenishing yeah. every two or three years. It's a lot of money. Um, and they also put on shows all over the world now. So in the States, it's ending all this stuff needs transporting around. 
I got involved and got all the ex-members together and did a massive fundraise to secure their future. Uh, but since then, the, the IMPS has always required more money. Yeah. Um, so myself and my wife came to a decision that we were going to become their main sponsors because if it had the effect it had on me in life, then if it has that on one other person yeah. growing up in East London in difficulty, then that would be an amazing thing to do. So we're the main sponsors of the IMPS Motorcycle Display Team. And to be honest with you, the best thing that you could do to ever support the IMPS is look them up. It's called impsonline.com and go to one of their shows. As Nick said, they perform all over the country, um, mainly in the home counties, but probably one show a year in central London. Um, and they're just amazing to see. This isn't this isn't kids driving around in a circle on a motorbike. This is yeah. young children flying through the air backwards on bikes. Yeah, someone once said to me the other day, you know, nuts. do you think the motorcycle thing uh, helped your ability for risk taking? And I guess, yeah, it must have. I mean, at the age, <laughs> yeah. of, at the age of 13, I learned to jump a motorbike through fire. At the age of 15, I learned to jump a motorbike over cars. At the age of 16, I was jumping motorbikes over multiple cars and sort of 40, 50 people and flying through the air at 50 50 feet in the air. So it's an amazing thing to see if you can get to see it. Uh, It's always, I'm not going to, you know, you know, charities are always in desperate need of money. There's certainly a donation button on on the website if you had a five or spare. Um, But the biggest thing you could do actually is just go and see them because actually spreading the word about them is more important because the more people that know about them, the more chances are that the right children get into the team. And what the imp suffers with is people go to these shows and they go, my son wants to be a member. Why can't he be a member? And they, you know, it's very difficult to say to someone's parents, they can't be a member because you live in a seven bedroom detached house (laughs) in Westminster, madam. Um, This is for disadvantaged children. And it's important it stays that way because it's not an adventure activity. You know, if you want that, go to Go Ape of a weekend. This is about, this is more about that. This is about educating children through motorcycle as the sort of the enabler yeah it's not a bunch of kids having fun on motorcycles so that's important and then yeah the second thing is that the, the imps during another um financial difficulty moment in the early 90s was supported by the princess trust mm-hmm. and when i sold hito i decided that i wanted to support charities wider and my wife and i looked around and thought the princess trust was ideal because they have one they have a project about for disadvantaged people but young people but also they have a project for disadvantaged young people bringing them into business yeah and i was keen to do that so we started supporting them a a couple of years ago um doing various talks uh, inspirational talks in sort of various centers around the country but also uh, donating money and then i was really fortunate that um about eight or nine months ago i was asked if i would take over the role as chairman there of their enterprise network which is about getting entrepreneurs into the princess trust so it's entrepreneurs supporting entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and that is just launched in october of last year actually its first event is later this month But if any of the listeners are keen to get involved in a charity earlier in life rather than waiting until they retire. So what I found with the Prince's Trust was everyone who gets involved is sort of 50, 60, 70 because the the amount they donate is quite high. But my view was that we're losing lots of people because some people like to support things for a long period of time, like to have a connection with it. And there's lots of young entrepreneurs that don't have 25 grand a year to give to a charity, but do have five or 10 grand a year to give to a charity or do have other stuff that they could give to a charity. So why are we not engaging those? So yes, I'm the chairman and my wife uh, ad- administers it from a management point of view. It's called the Enterprise Network. You can locate it on the Princess Trust website and that will come straight through to me and i will then engage with you and talk you through the process um but we are trying to build out a network of around 50 entrepreneurs is my target before i hand over the chairmanship to someone else okay. so i'm about getting it going and and getting this thing up up off the ground or by all means you can connect with me direct i mean i'm not difficult to find if you google jamie waller you'll find my own website which is yep. jamiewaller.co.uk or on any of the usual social media um, platforms. The only thing I would say on social media is obviously you get uh, quite a few requests every day and stuff like that. It might be worth just saying, you know, uh, as per Smith and Williams podcast or Nick Travis or something like yeah, that. Will I can help. always make a connection. Yeah. I can act as your bad guy screen. You yeah, I know James very busy actually this month. It's not that I don't <laughs> respond. Actually, I have this thing that I try and respond to everyone. But one thing I would say to some people that listen, you know, is some people 
I, so I made a decision quite early on in life that I would never not respond to anyone that reached out to me because you never know. Yeah. So even if people are asking things to me that, and they haven't read my website, I, I don't go, you know, you don't meet the bracket. I respond to them saying, not for me, da, 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 you might want to speak to John. But that requires a lot of effort, right? A lot of taxi time yeah. and well, train time and stuff like that. But it's, it is a bit annoying that people then go, oh, but but could I just meet you for a coffee anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's not that I don't want to meet for a coffee, it's that I've already got probably a, the next 600 coffees <laughs> lined up. Um, so to add an, to, to add it to number 601 is a bit unnecessary because it means I just let other people down and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm very open, very approachable. I don't want to be rude to anyone. Would always be out to help if I can, but it's just really difficult. So you know, if it's one question, if someone wants to reach out because they want to know something and just ask the question, don't expect a coffee for the answer because I've got the time to respond, but probably don't have the time for coffee. And also, I don't love coffee that much. <laughs> yeah, six a day. Um, so I think we're nearly at the end of the, the podcast, but it would be silly not to ask you what you're up to nowadays and what the next couple of years looks like. Yeah. So, um, well, thanks. It's uh, so having left both businesses, I found purpose was a real I, I never realized the importance of purpose actually until those six weeks off post um selling hito yep. and then i set up fire starters and i wanted so the the business model of fire starters is we never want to own a majority we want to own a minority with some majority controls so a significant minority but what i realized quite quickly is i wasn't really getting from that what i needed and what i needed was that entrepreneurial buzz again you know some people need to jump over cars or motorbikes every weekend. Some people need to play baseball. And mine is I need to be doing business. So actually more recently, uh, we launched a company called Just. Uh, and you can obviously Google that to find what that is. But Just is about all of the improvements we made in JPW for a silo of the enforcement industry. How can we make those across the entire UK? How can we make them countrywide? And what we've built is a, what we call an enforcement market integrator. Yeah. So it's for post litigation integration model. We have a bunch of very large litigation partners, so lawyers on the on a panel, it's a marketplace, a bunch of data providers to enrich the data, and a bunch of enforcement companies. And what we do is we sit between the person who's owed the money and how they collect it, and we drive the entire compliance and behavior of how it's done. Okay. And that, for me, is where I want to sort of hang my hat up after this one. If I can deliver even 80% of the improvements I delivered in JBW for the government clients that they work for across the entire UK. What I want to see is I honestly wholeheartedly believe that everybody has the right to be paid what they are owed. Mm -hmm. But, and there's a big but, it has to be done fairly with consideration and compassion. Yeah. And Just is about delivering that. So we have this thing at Just uh, with our sales guys at the moment. If you go into a meeting, I say, say this in your head, don't say it out loud, but I'm going to say it out loud. We say, if you don't care about your own reputation, then we don't care about you. Okay. Fair enough. So that is our one Similar qualifying criteria for our taking on customers. So if you're owed money and you don't care about your own reputation, then we are not the people for you. But if you do, or you feel there's a chance that you might change to be that way, then please look us up because we are very quickly, we launched on the 23rd of September of last year. So we're roughly five to six months in and we are very quickly, I believe after year one will be the second largest enforcement provider in the UK. Um, and I, we are fighting to be the largest very quickly. We want to bring a level of expertise, a level of intelligence, accessibility and safeness to this industry that hasn't been seen in the past 200 years. Brilliant. <laughs> you sound pretty focused on the mission there. Yeah, I'm really excited. You know, it's what makes me jump out of bed in the morning. It's what gets me on trains, planes, flying around the country. I have a real purpose. Again, I realized after exiting that my purpose hadn't quite finished because, yes, we had helped probably a few hundred thousand people, but there's, you know, over 70 million people living in the UK and any one of us can fall into debt at any time. And if it's not you, it could be your mother, it could be your brother, your children. And the very least you can expect is for them to be treated fairly through that process. Jamie, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for taking some time out to speak to us when things are so like nascent and busy. So it's great. Really appreciate it. Um, so great. That was an amazing story um, to all the listeners. If you uh, enjoyed that and want to hear more, make sure that you subscribe. Um, we had quite a, a wide ranging conversation, so there are going to be links 
um, underneath the episode, so you should be able to see those now. Um, so click on those and you know maybe make a donation if you're feeling like you can. Uh, but until next time, that's all for me, and thanks to Jamie Waller. Thank you. This SMW The Pulse podcast is of general nature and is not a substitute for professional advice. No responsibility can be accepted for the consequences of any action taken or refrained from as a result of what is said. The views expressed are not necessarily those of the presenter or of Smith & Williamson or any of its affiliates. No reproduction of this podcast may be made in whole or in part for professional or recreational purposes. No action should be taken based on this podcast and we accept no liability if we change your views on any of the subjects mentioned.